Okay, so defamation is used as, so this lecture is a, a kind of quick thing, what do we mean by geodetic? And then the, the four methods, or three methods I'll talk about are coral microethyls, which many of you know better than me, because this is one of the most famous places in the world for coral microethyls. And then second is GPS. And, I'll, and GPS, I'll also discuss a little bit of some subduction zone deformation model and how you would study it with GPS and also coral microethyl. And then we'll end with the start. Okay? And just some, uh, many of the figures with some come from this textbook. So, uh, as I mentioned before, it's uh, my, basically my favorite. If you only had to buy one book, this would be the best one. <laughs> like the commercial, this is the commercial. Okay? Even though they don't give them to me for free, I have to buy them also. But, uh, and there are others you can have as well, but this newly updated volume two is very good. So let's get going. So what is geodesy anyway? So it's the branch of mathematics really that's concerned with the determination of the size and shape of the earth, and really for our purposes, the exact positions of points on the earth's surface, and usually over time scales less than decades. And so when we say deformation geodetic, we usually also mean short time scale, as opposed to when we say deformation geomorphic, we might mean hundreds of years to thousands. We say deformation geologic, we mean millions. Okay, so technically geodesy is about measuring positions on the Earth, but usually it's done with instruments, which is usually only the last few decades. So just an example, you have to know, you know, latitude, longitude, or elevation, and much of the geodesy, especially GPS, is absolute positioning, which means it's relative to the middle of the Earth, and whereas other positioning is relative. So I say, you know, relative, you know, from here, go 10 meters that way, 3 meters that way, and down 4 meters. So you have to know what it's relative to, whereas other methods are relative to the center of the Earth, which means absolute for everything. And we also have to worry about the shape of the Earth. So we have to think of data with a reference frame. So many times when we look at geodesy or GPS vectors, for example, it's relative to what? Where, you know, what's the reference frame? And when we, for example, talk about uh, vertical motion, we need to know the data, uh, the sort of shape of the Earth that we're comparing it to. And we may need to know sea level, how it's changing over time. So this figure, I, I'm not so happy with it, but because it seems more complicated than it needs to be. But this just shows spatial scale, so from one kilometer to ten thousand kilometers, versus time scale in seconds. So this would be one day, one year, and different phenomena, so creep events, earthquakes, uh, post seismic rebound, plate boundary tectonics, and the different tools we use to measure them. So, one, this VLBI is an older method called very long baseline interferometry. And so this is how the first way they could measure the actual motion of the continents, but let's say North America to Europe, and so thousands of kilometer length scale. And then GPS is really revolutionary because it applies to many length scales, and it's also easy for, for us to use now. We have one, my phone has GPS, right? So we all have this technology with us. And other technologies like um, this EDM is laser rangefinder. So sometimes you can just measure the distance from one place to another. It's pretty accurate, so you can look at changing distances. Also, EDM implies, um, although it would be more of just uh, a theodolite, changing angles. And then this, what, what seems to me slightly strange in this figure is the, this OB is observation. So I think this means what humans could see or measure. So, you know, we can see, like in our lifetime, some change, and over a few kilometers we can see, but otherwise we need instruments. So let's go to coral microaxle. So this is natural geodesy, and it can really mostly measure vertical, actually only measures vertical relative to sea level. And uh, as I said, you know, here, in Indonesia and even here in Lipi, you have uh, the one of the world experts, right? So Danny uh, Hillman, is, uh, he did his PhD 
see on this, and uh, there's much work going on still. And it's incredibly, uh, in my mind, a really clever way to study how how the Earth moves. So we know at sea level, and the sea level changes, but the corals are very sensitive to where sea level is. And if the coral moves up and down by tectonics, it will move relative to sea level, and it changes how it grows. And the other nice thing about these corals is that they uh, they grow in these annual rings, and they're easy to date, both by counting the rings, but also by using some uh, ge uh, geochronological isotopic methods to we can date. And the dating method is good within a few years sometimes. So you see the shapes of them. They're, they're just like a micro asshole from a small mound, and they have the mostly look at the top. And so the work, a lot of this comes from this site at, at uh, Caltech. So this movie is really nice. Maybe, have you guys seen this movie before? The Zandies movie, I think. Pretty good to grow. And the, this brown is the, the base of the sea floor. And then the blue is the water. And so what we want to watch is the highest level of survival. That's the, the top of the coral versus time. So let's see. So there's the coral growing every year, and it grows, and then it hits, and then it it can't hit. Yeah. So then there was some subsidence, keeps growing. Like that subsidence. We'll show this a few times, and then we can talk about it. Okay, so this is what we might see, and, and many of you know, you, they take a big saw, and they go and they cut the slab. They saw through the coral, they take a piece out and then look at it on the side, and there's pieces on the third floor here especially. But what we can see is, uh, if we go back, it's a little bit easier when the water's there. So when the water goes up, does that mean the, the land went down or went up? Down, yeah. yeah. So this was confusing to me for that. So if the sea level is fixed, are we correct for sea level? So they correct for time variation of sea level. So you assume the ocean doesn't actually change. So what's really changing is where the, the, the land is or the bottom of the, the bottom of the asphalt itself, which means the side makes it appear like the water is deeper, and uplift means that the water looks shallower, right? And so when we look at these different parts of the record, so here it's growing, and, and that was just the early, like, it was just first form. So now it kind of shows, okay, right here, this time was no change, just a constant sea level. No displacement. So now, what happened? Uplift, right? So it's something lifted the asshole. So we see, actually, so that highest level of survival went down. Now things are steady, and oh, what happened? Subsidence, so something pushed it down, right? And so we see now, highest level of survival and goes back up and then it's holding steady uh oh uplift right so it takes some time and this is that's why this movie is very useful because you have to you know be clever to understand how the coral responds to uplift and subsidence or changing water level but once you you understand this response then you can interpret it in terms of what they the geodesy, so the changing uh, elevation of the sea floor. So this is uh, really, I think, quite interesting. So here's some examples. 
just pictures, same thing. This is from Danny's PhD. So if you go and you look at the corals in this building, they see they're pretty white. Uh, and you can't really see that well, but so what they do is they x-ray them. And so then when they x-ray, you can see the variations in density that define the, the coral ring. And so here's this one. And so they, they dated it right here. So they have these samples that help give them kind of an anchor in terms of approximately the age. And then they can count backward and forward. And so this particular case, it mostly just shows that uh, there was submergence, right? Because the coral could keep, keep growing and growing. And so this was possible to calculate this average submergence rate of 5 millimeters, 5.4 millimeters per year. So uh, to me, it's very, uh, I don't know, I think it's so interesting, so powerful. So, so here's a, a more complex one from Danny's PhD, and it shows a long record, so it's a really big coral, and you see it, it began to grow in the 1700s and then grew out sideways here. And so we can see, you know, so if it's going up like this, this means submergence, right? And then when this, uh, this drops down, this means this is... Uh, herb emergence event, so uplift. So this shows three big earthquakes, although they were distant. And so each time, you know, it's being subsided and then lifts up. And then the side between earthquakes lifts up. And then in 1935, nearby was a, a bigger earthquake, 1927.7, and it just lifted the thing out and almost killed the coral. Right? So, any comments? Mostly, do you guys mostly already know the story of coral because it's so famous here? Yeah? No? Most, so, how many people already know this, have heard this many times? Some. But so, other, you guys have heard it so much? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so you know it, but you may not actually do it yourself. Yeah. So, anyway, it's, uh, I don't do it myself either, but uh, I'm a student of it. Okay, so let's look at what does it mean if we look at these uh, subduction zones, and in our practical activities the last two days, we've been already discussing this, is that, you know, it depends where you are relative to the subduction zone, whether or not you're subsiding or or uplifting in the intertidal time and also what happens in the earthquake itself. So in this little uh, sketch here, you know, when you have things locked in the interseismic period, these four arc islands go down. So they, as they go down, that means we see on these corals this uh, increasing height of highest level of survival. But then during the earthquake, because of the balance, the co-seismic part of the earthquake cycle, they lift up. So this relationship right here is what is shown here. So between the earthquake, it's subsiding. In the earthquake, it gets uh, lifted up, especially this one. So, but it depends where you are. So the land position relative to the trench changes. So in Alaska and also in Japan, the shoreline, and, and here too, but uh, the evidence, what's really also nice about Sumatra is these, there are these four arc islands, so the corals live around these four arc islands, but not every subduction zone has a four arc that is exposed. So other times you have to go to the further out towards the arc, and this might be a place that actually uplifts between the earthquake, the opposite of the four arc, but during the earthquake it gets pulled down. And so this happened in Alaska, and so we were exploring this the other day. The, the, here, this, this lighter color is the uplift, and this is the subsidence. And so this, in this place, there was uh, two meters of subsidence in 1964 earthquake, and these trees, they don't like to live in the ocean. They can't handle the salt water, but they were pushed down 
two meters, and so the sea level, the ocean water came and it killed the trees. And so this is commonly observed in Cascadia, so northwestern North America and Alaska. These dead forests are from uh, subsidence, coastlines of subsidence. And in, uh, we already saw this movie, I won't show it again uh, right now, but for Japan, we could measure the, the displacement down of the coast. And here's a satellite image of Sendai in Japan. So you see the coastline is very clear. And this is before the earthquake, and here it is after the earthquake. And so there's coastal flooding, so the coast is sided. So we know that from the GPS that went down by 50 centimeters, but you can see, just look right here, this area. So the change of the clouds, but this area subsided. See how it's wet now and flooded? So this is a problem, right, for the tsunami because you lower everything by 50 centimeters, it makes the tsunami even worse. But this is also the reason why it subsided is because of this process right here, that is the position of the coast is above the site part of the rupture. So here, uh, now we're all ex-Coulomb experts, so I just made this calculation just now. And I want to encourage you, you know, the Coulomb's not that hard. You can explore these things yourself. And so here's the, I just have it here so we can look at the model. So I, I made it, let's just do displacement. There's the three vectors. So this is a, a big model. Actually, let me open it so you can see. Um, so I made it's a thousand kilometer long model with a uh, ten kilometer spacing. So just so you can see the input file. So main things that I change are the grid is minus five hundred to five hundred and ten kilometer increments, and then the fault I just made it x is at a hundred. So that you can see the position of the tip of the fault right here at 100. And then it goes from plus 250 kilometers to minus 250. So it's 500 kilometer long fault. And then I said, okay, the top set minus five kilometers. And I said the bottom is 60 kilometers. See, uh, structure. And so if we run that dislocation 3D vectors, so here you can see the subduction, the fault at depth. And you see this pulling in. This is the horizontal displacement that we measured from the Japanese network, pulling the coast over, but also pushing it down. And this big long arrow here, this is in the seafloor, so we don't see this, but this is a tsunami generating uplift of the seafloor. And if we go to then here, you can see if I compute the Vertical displacement. So this shows that. So this shows that if the, I put that 20 meters of slip on the fault, and so maximum seafloor uplift in this simple model is more than eight meters, and then maximum subsidence of the coast in this simple model looks like about two. So it's generally consistent with what we think. The GPS showed that coastal subsidence is about 50 centimeters, so maybe the coast will really disappear. So you have to measure more carefully to figure out exactly where the fault is relative to the coastline. So you may say, oh, we'll do a geodesy. And the answer is that something like Coulomb lets us build models to interpret the geodesy measurement. And so if you look at the at the, this group, Levy group, and the, the Caltech and Singapore group, they use things like Coulomb to interpret uplift and, and subsidence of the, the uh, to much production zone, the same tools are used for research. Okay, so any questions about the coral micro assholes and simple production zones? Okay, so let's do GPS. So these are some old figures that uh, basically the idea of GPS was it was uh, started by United States Defense because they uh, wanted to be able to navigate military uh, equipment. And so there's 24 GPS satellites, and uh, they initially was defense, but now we see it's really useful for commercial, so, and it's open. And uh, now there's also Russian, has GLONASS, and uh, 
Europeans have something called Galileo. So many of these same kind of systems. And the idea is that uh, what it does is it, it sends a, a, just a signal from the, the uh, satellite that can be received. And it's either this L1 signal or L2. And they, they are, well, these are used for the high, high precision geodesy. And maybe for like my, my phone or for the handheld GPS, it might only use the L1. And the, when you have both L1 and L2, you can correct for atmospheric delay because the delay will be uh, a kind of a controlled by the timing between the two um, waves, and you can kind of correct out. You can take rid, take away the atmospheric delay if you have two channels, but it takes more computational power to use two channels. So most Handheld GPSs use the L1, but most uh, fancy GPSs use both channels. And so basically, you, it sends the signal, and it, it, what you do is you know the, it, it, you measure the phase, so the wave coming down, and you know the time it left the satellite, and the time that that wave gets to the receiver. So the real secret of GPS clock because you have to know exactly the time, and this travels at the speed of light, so that's the very good time. And so if you know time and speed, so that's why it's not perfect with the speed of light through the atmosphere, because you have to do atmospheric corrections. And you have multiple, so these circles show, okay, the time and speed says that it's this distance to this uh, satellite, so that's the green one. Okay, it's a little bit shorter distance to the blue one. There's the red one. There's the purple one. So the receiver just finds the best fitting position that and, uh, is consistent with all these distances to these satellites. And once you do that, and the more you have, so usually the your handheld receiver might have, well, now the new ones, you can see all the channels. They can do eight maybe, but uh, more... Uh, nicer systems can do 12, maybe if they can see all 12 satellites, or they can do GPS and GLONASS, so they'll use the Russian system as well. So you might have, you know, if you think of these spheres of distance, you might have 10 or 12 or 15, and so your error becomes quite well defined because it's exactly where you are. So then, um, if you have and, and because you have these multiple ones, you can basically get the, the, the position down to millimeter accuracy. So just as an example, and so we can see how this works, is uh, something I know the, the best um, from my experience. So Western North America, this project called Plate Boundary Observatory has 1,100 uh, GPS receivers. So this is a big project the U.S. government paid total of, I think, about $90 million to build it and to maintain it, uh, all for science, but it's really powerful. And so you can see the arrows changing length. So if we go, to go down here to these two stations, so they're cemented in, and they, in this place, because it's pretty well populated, they send their signal by telephone, by cellular mobile phone, basically. But they can also use satellite where they're further away. So if we just compare really what the GPS receiver is doing, here's what it's measuring. So the the Fallbrook station here, here's it. This is time versus north. Okay. So starting in about 2004 to 2013. So these solutions are maybe once an hour or once a day for continuous GPS. So I just average the position. And uh, horizontals are always better than vertical for a GPS. So this lower one is the vertical. You can see it's quite a bit noisier. So, but you see here is at minus 125, this relative position in 2004, and it's moved all the way to plus 125 millimeters. So it moved uh, two, what's, what's that, 200 millimeters in 
10, almost 10 years. It's really going pretty fast, right? So this is basically um, 27 millimeters a year. Well, the, actually, this is the north. 27 millimeters a year north. That's this one. But it's also going minus 27 millimeters a year east. Or, so because it's minus, it's actually going west, right? So that's, that's this one. So the way we get these velocities is, you know, the GPS only measures position. So you just keep measuring your position, and then you fit a line to the position data, and that's why it's called a time series, GPS time series. So, so, and so now, and then the vertical, you see it looks like it's going down just a little bit. And this is pretty noisy, though. It's two millimeters a year, but the, looks like the error is like plus or minus 10 millimeters. So this probably isn't resolved. Now look at the, this other station called Geology Road, some other station, has a little error or something, or maybe an earthquake, I don't know, some displacement. And the scale is different here. So if we plotted these the same scale, this range is 300 millimeters, this range is only 75. This is only going north 6 millimeters a year. So the important thing to see is there's a 20 millimeter a year difference between these two stations. So that's why this arrow is so much longer than this arrow. Okay? And then same with the uh, east. So maybe it's obvious to you, but this is how, actually what happens when we make these. This would be a kind of a velocity map, a velocity vector map, but it's really defined by time series. Okay? So, question. Oh, these are high quality, so they're inland, and they drill them maybe uh, 10 meters down with uh, legs. So they call drilled braced monuments, and or they may do 10 meter deep cement, and then let the cement uh, solidify, and then they put them out. So no building, because the buildings are usually much more noisy. Yeah, no, it's it's difficult to, to do sighting. Buildings can be okay if it's a big, hot, heavy building, like, but even this building, you know, it just moves a little bit. And in an earthquake, it should move a lot, right? What we really care about is the ground surface. So uh, in North America and other countries, there's other GPS networks that are used for a transportation or for surveying, and so many of those are lower quality GPS systems, and they'll be on buildings anywhere, and they can be quite noisy. But this why this one is more special. It's placed on the reserve trail, it's so expensive that all of them are very high quality, sensitive, deep braces, protected, and real time. So they send their data all the time on the mobile phone or on the internet. So let's look at, uh, just looking at subduction zones again, because many of you are interested in them, what do we see with GPS on subduction zones? So, this, this one. So we've been showing this model, but it's good just to keep in your mind, you know, as much as possible. So this has three, uh, three locations. One that's uh, maybe a station and a grid of point near the bottom end of the lock zone, and then in the subduction zone there may be kind of a transitional zone where it's episodically creeping and then deep is constant slip. And so if we just stop for a moment, this is trying to show what the GPS receiver would do. So this receiver's moving, this one, nothing here. So this is the strain accumulation, interseismic, horizontal motion toward the continent or with the down going slab. Keeps going. Now, so see what happens. So in these transitional zones, the base of the lock zone is actually what we call episodic tremor and slip. So here it's just showing episodic slip. So there's 
slow earthquakes down there that relax some of the stress, but not all. And so this uh, this phenomenon was discovered by GPS in Cascadia in uh, in uh, Canada. They found it first, and now you can see it in all the soft vegetables. I don't know if it's been described yet for Sumatra. Maybe you guys know. But, uh, so you see the point about this site is it's still accumulating strain. It's still moving towards the continent, but not as fast as this one. So there's some release of the strain at depth. But still, this one is not moving. So this would just be uh, inner seismic strain accumulation that you would measure with GPS, horizontal motion. So it shows it's important to have the GPS in the right places. So you want it, these GPS receivers that are closer to the trench will really measure more of what the locked signal inner seismic strain accumulation is like, whereas these further away may not see it. So if just to illustrate a little bit more of this episodic tremor and slip, which again was discovered using GPS, is another kind of a detail. So this would just be one station fixed to the ground. This shows a little bit of the noise, so it's, it's not perfect. And there's the, the motion. So this is what I showed before, but why they call it episodic tremor and slip is this is showing the slip, but at the same time, there's seismic waves that are the tremor. So it's like a, a little earthquake makes seismic energy, uh, but it's kind of slow uh, or not a big earthquake. And, and so we see in, especially in Cascadia subduction zone in North America, there's a combined GPS and seismic network that observes these phenomena. Okay, so any questions on this? Would you? Well, for a strike slip system, it's best if you can't remember how we did our dislocation. You want to see the arc hands and you want to see this gradient across. So you need a few par. So you can know, okay, what's the long-term motion? And then when you get with, and remember we said that the real scale is the locking depth. So when you're within about one locking depth, you need a few more. But when you're far, the far away, it doesn't matter. So you just need a few more far away, and then you can densify near the fault. But you don't want to have them all on the fault. You need to be distributed across the locking depth. Like 10 kilometers, you need, you know, 1, 5, 10, and then 50, maybe. And then on the other side, 1, 5, 10, 50. You're welcome. Okay, so let's keep going. So th these would be the kinds of measurements that are made with GPS in subduction zones now. And, but also there's GPS. This was uh, just to show a little bit of work. I actually was helping me to find some references. This is GPS uh, publication here in Java. So this is a, a project, and you guys may know these colleagues. Abedin is the first author, and also Irwan Milano, Danny, Harry Harjono, so lead the team, right? But what they did is they, they did uh, GPS around some of the faults of Java, but what they did is this is called campaign survey. So they don't put the GPS receivers out permanently. They go set the GPS receiver up above the benchmark very carefully, maybe measure for one day the position, and then come back. So you see December, August, August. So you know just every six months to a year, and so then you have three positions. And so then you fit a line to the position time series to get the velocity. And so then these are the arrows showing the velocity. So there's some gradient across the Lembon fault, but nothing that you can say is very systematic. So, you know, maybe we need to just wait a little bit more to, although they show the errors are small, 
but um, you know, there's nothing. It looks more just like it's extensional. So where we are, Bungu is going south faster than Limbang, so there's more extension across Limbang Fault than shear, right? So it's an interesting result, but uh, maybe we need to make some more measurements and have sensor networks to see more of signal. So then also observations are from uh, Sumatra. This may be a little bit older, uh, but they call the sugar array, Sumatra GPS array. And um, here's some, so I just think this, uh, I think you gave this to me or from the, um, so you see there's this guy, John Galeska, he's one of the engineers from Tectonics Observatory of Caltech and also EO from Singapore. He does a lot of the maintenance. So you can see here's a good GPS receiver installation and they call, this is the welded brace mount. So these, these, legs, they drill deep. They might be 10 meters down or more. Uh, and then they weld it here, and then the receiver is bolted on. And then you see the electrical comes down from the antenna, goes underground over to here, solar antenna, battery for charging, and a computer. And then I don't know if this one is, uh, it would probably be, well, maybe it's continuously communicating, so by mobile phone or satellite. Satellite, these are? Yes? These sat, okay. So here they are. So there's some vectors from uh, the forearm. And so you see the, we know the incoming plate is, uh, this really shows this coupling across the subduction zone with the oblique convergence. So we know that actually the subduction goes straight down. So this oblique convergence contributes to shearing on the Sumatran fault also. Okay, so I know some of you know more than I do about this, but is this network, is this all or is there more? More. That's the older side, right? Okay, so last one. So uh, still we have a little bit of time, right? Okay. So last thing is INSAR. So this is uh, interferometric synthetic aperture radar, and most of this lecture comes from some materials by Shimon Widowinski uh, from Miami. And so the INSAR is really good at measuring earthquakes and volcanoes. And so this picture will come back, but this is uh, INSAR images from um, Andes, so from Western South America. One. So basically, synthetic aperture radar is a satellite-based system, and it sends the radar wave out. It sends this pulse. It's like a kind of a simple outgoing pulse, and then it returns multiple reflections. So like it may get a return from the house, which is a little bit closer, but also the tree. So this kind of complex radar signal, and the radar can be used for imaging, so we can measure... Like this is just straight radar satellite of Florida. And so it's just showing the brightness, how much the energy is coming back. And so it's used also for environmental things like oil spills because it changes the reflectivity of the sea surface. And this just shows also the radar reflectivity of a satellite image versus the radar reflectivity from the, the radar itself. Sorry, this is optical reflection, so different satellite system, and then the radar, and so it just shows the brightness. So this is uh, like a single radar image. But the second thing that's done is if the satellite has a measurement, goes down, gets the distance, and and the, the satellite is signal has these waves, then we can measure the phase. So is it, you know, a kind of positive phase or negative phase, or depends, you can say in the, you know, angular measure, is it, uh, you know, zero or, you know, pi or two pi. And um, so what we do is we, we measure the phase, which is basically how many waves down to the ground one time. 
And it, so it's a number of waves that might be, you know, a million wavelengths. But we can measure how many waves it is. And then if we go by again with the satellite and we measure how many waves or partial waves there are, this is the phase comparison. That's why it's called interferometry. And so there's the wave goes down, comes back. That's the range. And the, the, it's actually really good with this phase measurement. So if you just do the phase just by itself, you get this really complex uh, math doesn't mean very much. But what we do is we compare them, as I said, one, and then time passes, the satellite comes back and it shoots it again. And so we can compare each pixel here is like one wave, you know, is it uh, positive or negative? That's based in mass of crests and troughs. And this would be the like the next one, and they might be, you know, slightly offset the peak. So when you subtract them, that's their interferometry, and that gives you a phase difference. And so if you know the wavelength and the speed of light, you can turn the phase difference into a change in distance, or the phase difference into a range change, which is distance from the satellite. So here it is. So here's the two satellites. They need to be close together, less than a kilometer apart for this to work. So this just shows what I was saying. So shoots out. If there's some ground motion, so see here, this A, the two phases are quite comparable. It's exactly the same piece of wave. But here there was an earthquake that pushed B closer to the satellite. So when the satellite measures the distance again, it has some change in range. So you can, that's why then, because we see it as fringes, those are just these, these sort of phase differences. And each cycle is a, is a sequence of color. So it depends on the wavelength, what the, what the range difference is, uh, you know, depends. So like in this case, 10 centimeter of uplift would produce three fringes of deformation for this particular wavelength. So the where it's used is, for example, you know, we see earthquake deformation land. Some sites also something show something there. Very good on volcanoes because volcanoes have big signals, usually bigger than earthquakes, and they're also more vertical. So this is the range changes distance to the satellite. It's not vertical and it's not horizontal. It's just some oblique range change, but it's more vertical than horizontal. So that's why usually volcanoes do better because they have more vertical signals. Same thing with subsidence is more vertical than most earthquakes, which are more horizontal. And then you can also, that's used for studying glaciers. So if we look at uh, this composite, just showing many sites, this shows many volcanoes of, of the Andes with uplift or subsidence in these patterns. And then these patterns here are associated with earthquakes. So this one is a magnitude 8.1, and you can see the coastal uplift. Here's another one, or it could be subsided. But you see the uh, very nice measurement, and the, the why the insert is really useful is it, it makes a map, which if you had a GPS, you would have to have thousands of GPS receivers. But you don't have to have to do it even PBO. All of Western North America only has 1,100. So it's good uh, to make this map of the range change. And what's best is when you can do both. So here's just an example of the kind of a famous INSAR result for the Landers earthquake, in, which was the earthquake in California in 1992. Strike slid right lateral. We saw the uh, Coulomb pattern. And so what you can see is, is with the range change, the distance between the fringes is 28 millimeters. So because it's white right lateral, as we come to this end of the fault, there's a lot of uplift. Makes sense, right? You come to the end, you have uplift, and then maybe you have sides down here. So 
this is the observed signal, which is pretty impressive. And then they use the dislocation model, like Coulomb, to calculate the equivalent expected interferogram. And so what that told them was it gave them constraints on the slip distribution along the fault. So this was early when this was done in the 1990s, but now it's commonly used basically take the interferogram on the left and use it to, to constrain the slip distribution on fault at depth. Any questions so far? So the other thing you can do, this is a, is a, basically this doesn't have a map that goes with it, but there's to be a fault in China and they did uh, a few INSAR passes across the fault. But instead of making the map, they just collapsed all of the, the instar interferogram into a single swath. And then they also converted it, not just fringes, they, they basically added the fringes up. So they said, okay, you know, 0 to 28, 28 to 56, uh, you know, 56 to 84. And so they could get the full, uh, change it so that it shows this uh, basically strain accumulation across the pi one fault and then it compares with the GPS pretty nicely. So there was no earthquake there. This just shows strain accumulation. It's pretty narrow so it implies kind of a shallow locking depth on the pi one fault. And it shows about five millimeters a year which then you could compare with uh, offsets from geology or geomorphology. So just final example, this is not so much earthquakes, but it's uh, human interaction with the environment in Indonesia. So this is a paper on sinking cities of Indonesia. So it's, uh, and this is ALS, ALOS Palsar, so this is a Japanese radar satellite, detects rapid subsidence due to groundwater and gas extraction. And this is from 2007 to 2009. So you can see all these different major cities. So we can just look at Bandung, for example, as a zoom here. So this is the, and this would be the interferogram. So this is what they call it. If you unwrap the interferogram, that's how you get the actual uh, change in range or the displacement. And so what they can show us is Bandung. So I guess we are around here, right? This is where we are. So somewhere west of town, in this A position, just right at the middle, they, and they had many, uh, satellite passes. So it, the classic example I showed before was just two pairs. But you can do, in the modern way people are doing NSAR, many pairs. And so you can compare the whole sequence and watch the phase change over multiple images. So these are all of the images that they have versus time. And so the site A is just going down really quite a bit, 20 centimeters a year, right? So that's much. Um, and so then what they did was they didn't have any information from the government or anything. So they just looked at Google Earth and all they could see was, well, it looks like it's an industrial place there, but probably there's a big well, a big water well that's pulling water and that's driving the side. And then B is here, not quite as rapid side uh, C, and D. So uh, this just shows, uh, it's, you know, I know our class is about active tectonics, but just shows how INSAR can be very useful for other things and shows uh, it's good if the signal is big. So 20 centimeters here is a big signal. You wouldn't usually see for tectonics. Uh, and it's commonly used for observing society. So not just this is the new one, but where I live in Phoenix, we have lots of NSAR images that are seen just dropping because big desert place, a lot of pumping of water, pull the water out of the ground. The water's no longer there to keep the pores apart. They have pore collapse. And the collapse of the pores causes the subsidence of the ground surface. And uh, also we see this in many oil fields. The oil fields will subside. And so this can be used uh, for monitoring, and then oil companies now they use INSAR because if you can build a model, like even using dislocation model, you can tell exactly where in the oil field you're pumping from. And so you get really good uh, management information about the oil field from INSAR. 
So that's uh, my lecture for you.